podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is here. Uh, roger that. And so is Mountain Dew. Roger that. Unlock in-game rewards like only Dew can. Wait. What rewards? A dual operator skin. Man, I love operator skins. Dual double XP. Dual double XP? Dual double XP. Even Call of Duty points. You're kidding me. Call of Duty points? This is incredible. I can't believe it. This Soldier, is... get a hold of yourself. Oh, roger that. Look for specially marked packaging and visit MountainDewGaming.com for details and restrictions. Open to U.S. Resident 17 Plus. Call of Duty points available only on 12 and 24 packs. Ends through 28, 23. And welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. On today's show, I'm joined by Ricky Hall, groom and work rider to this year's Cartier Horse of the Year by Eid. Thanks for joining me on The Paddock and the Pavilion, Ricky. Oh, no bother. Well, how are you? Yeah, very well. Oh, boy, he actually also was the champion older horse. So he got two awards, not just the one. Yeah, yeah, we were spoiled for it, I think. And um, you've just come back from a break, I think, haven't you? Have you had a long season? Um, had little time off because of Bayes racing. So, uh, yeah, I had a break once he'd finished. Um, we went up to see my other half's family. Just got back. And your fiance's just had a little girl, I think. Is that right? Yeah, we've got a five-month-old girl who doesn't like sleeping very much (laughs) well all your early mornings uh, at uh, the yard you you can't have had much sleep during the summer yeah no it's it's been pretty hectic uh a lot of learning um outside the yard and then doing what i know how to do what when i go to work so i'm sure you're learning how to change nappies and that sort of thing as well yeah that's it but i'd I'd like to start by asking you how sad you were when by headed off to stud on as you say halloween yeah it was it was bittersweet really it was the end of a a long run with him i drove all the way back from cumbria to see him off uh, and then drove back up there so I, I i was knackered by the time i got here but it's well worth being there for the send off everyone that was involved was there to see him go as well so that was nice to see him all turn out he got a good send off then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone, everyone that's had anything to do with him was there to see him off, and all the Shadwell's team were there to welcome him when he got there. So he was spoiled for it, really. I wanted to start by talking about your own background. How did you start yourself in racing? Well, my my brother was a conditional jockey for a little while, um, and I used to go and ride out in my summer holidays. Uh, for Andy Tunnell and then I decided I didn't want to work in racing and went off to college for two years doing photography and journalism uh, and <laughs> then decided to pack that in and go back into racing and ended up at Luca Grani's. Um I mean I've ridden horses my whole life and it seems sort of the easy option if I'm honest. <laughs> well, that's why you're so good on these uh, interviews and podcasts then if you wanted to do, go into journalism then. Uh, I, I've had I've had a bit of practice the last two years, I suppose. You said you worked at Luca Kamani's. How different was it working there to to working at um, where you are now at William Haggis's? Um, it was it was a different environment to be. Sort of, he was towards the end of his career. I mean, he had he still had horses like Presvis and uh, Postponed and things like that when I was there, but he'd gone over the peak of his career and he was going down. I was there for 10 years, so I was there for a a good while, but very, very professional and taught me an awful lot. I wouldn't be where I am now without having been there. Well, then moving on to working at um, William Haggis's, how did you come to look after Bayeed? Well, I'd, I'd been there, what, probably two years, I think when he arrived in the yard, maybe a year and a half, not even that long. And as a yearling, he was down in our other yard and everyone sort of does them then. And when he moved up to main yard, uh, one of my good friends actually looked after him for for a bit when he was in main yard. And uh, after he started winning, he said, I think you should look after him. You ride him every day. So and you take him to the races. I think you should be doing him every every day. And 
so that's that's when I took over. Um, that was a good good favour he did there, didn't he? Yeah, he was the lad that I've known growing up. I was sort of, I was in pony club with him. It's just so happened that we've ended up working in the same place. And yeah, I, I owe him an awful lot. He was the, a true gentleman about it. And some of the lads would have kicked up a quite fuss. It was before we knew quite how good he was, to be fair. I imagine if he won a couple of group ones, he uh, he might have been different about it <laughs> at the time. We must give this this uh, man a name. Who was that? Uh, Harry Thorpe Codman. He's actually left our yard now. He's uh, assistant for Richard Spencer. Well, he, he deserves a good shout out, doesn't he? So yeah, uh, yeah. He's. I've tried mentioning him in most interviews. So, <laughs> so as a two year old, by he didn't run. Did he pick uh, up an injury? Why did he not run as a two year old? He was. He took a long time to come to fruition. He wasn't an early sort. He hadn't shown an awful lot as a two-year-old. Um, it just looked like he needed time. Uh, and I think he he never had an injury. He just had sort of little niggling problems, sort of things like he'd, he'd just knock himself in the box or something like that. And just little things that took him time to get going again. And because of all the little breaks, it then adds up to you're not running them, but we were in no rush with him. He, he was always going to take a bit of time. and He's proven that he's got better with time. And what was the horse like as his temperament? I've had two friends of mine, Heather and Sam, have asked the same question and wanted to know what he was like to look after. Uh, he's a true gentleman. He He's never given us any issues uh, to deal with on the ground. He's, he's, you wouldn't think he was a cult. He just he he's very respectful of everyone, and he he loves attention. Really, you'd think he's a big old gelding that had been in the game for sort of ten years, and you forget he's he's only four, and he he's off to be a stallion now. And when did you realise that he was going to be something special? Uh, because I, I mean, he it, didn't make his debut until seventh of June, twenty twenty one, at Leicester. Yeah, at Leicester, where he fell out the stalls and came past everything in about half a furlong at the end of the race. But I, we didn't really know he was going to be a superstar. I think the penny started to drop at the listed race he had at Newmarket. I think it was his third run. When he won that, they, they were decent horses and he he went past them like they were nothing. And I think he won by seven lengths on the day. Um, and we really thought uh, we might have one here, but took a bit of time to confirm it. And did you always go with him on race days where you always leading him up? Uh, Leicester was the only day I didn't. At the time I was doing travelling for Haggis. So I was actually driving the box to Pontefract on that day. Um, and then from then on, I, I said to them, look, I think I'd, I'll go, I'll go with the horse instead of going racing elsewhere. He needs sort of a calm in hand at the races. He can, he could get a little bit, on edge uh, early in his career but once once he was there and settled he was fine it's just I think it took him some time to learn what he was doing and what was your relationship with Jim Crowley the jockey who, who rode him in the majority of his races yeah very good he picked up the ride uh, on his third start uh, Dane O'Neill rode him for the first two Jim has been a pleasure to be with when he's been at the races he's come in to ride and work occasionally and he's never given us anything to worry about on him he's um yeah he's Shadwell stable jockey and he, I mean he's been champion jockey you can't really complain about him he, he's he did a very good job on that horse and there's, he's never steered us wrong yet want more ways to show your good side to the world donate plasma at a Griffel center and join thousands of donors who are helping to save lives Receive up to $1,000 your first month. Learn more at grifflesplasma.com. And entering 2022, this year, it won six out of six. What did you think that Baid would achieve in, you know, this season? Uh, I mean, I thought the first run of the year, I thought that was probably the most likely we were to get beat because he was coming out of a long break. Uh, it was in the lock-inch. And 
I mean, you don't know if they've trained on from three to four. You don't know if he's got any better or if he's still as good as he was. And we went into that. And once we won that, I was fairly comfortable that we'd win anything over a mile. It was just a question of whether or not we could step up later in the year. And what was the buzz like in the yard each time he was ready to run? Yeah, I mean, just everyone it's given everybody a lift. So we've had a couple of pretty dismal years with COVID and things and him being in the yard and having that stable star to get behind has given everybody a lift completely. I think it's it's not just people in the yard, it's the crowds and everyone. They're, because they haven't been on the race courses for a while, when they're getting back, they've got someone something to get behind and I, I think it's given everybody a lift. Yes, going to Royal Ascot this year must have been so different from, you know, the two previous years. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, I mean, he hadn't ran in front of a crowd for a, a while. Like he, he, he hadn't had that atmosphere. And then this year, he's had everything, and it's been, it's been brilliant. And you mentioned about by moving up in distance, were you? confident that he would stay the extra two furlongs when he ran in the Judmont at York? Yeah, I I think we were confident he'd stay the trip. We knew we needed good ground for it because it's, it, it would have been testing otherwise to ask him to do more on worse ground. And I think he did, well, he proved us proved us very right. I, early in his career, I actually thought he wanted more than a mile before he ran first time, I thought he needed further. Um, when he was a yearling, I didn't think he was a particularly fast horse. Um, and he proved me wrong completely. And then in the Judmont, proved me right that he, the trip seemed to suit him absolutely perfectly. He, he did it very, very well. He looked probably a better horse for going the extra two and a half furlongs. And what are you like as a watcher? Where do you watch from? Are you nervous? Uh, I, uh, Yeah, every single race I've got very nervous. I think York was probably the first time I watched the whole race life. All the others, I I wouldn't watch them. I'd, I'd, be stood, I'd be stood in the stands, probably facing the other way. And you could tell from the crowd if he was winning because it was a, it was a spectacle to see when he came past horses. It was, it was incredible. And after winning at York, there was lots of chat then about whether he'd run in the uh, Irish Champion Stakes, whether he'd run in the Arc. What were your thoughts on those two races? Uh, I would have liked to go to Ireland. I think we would have got quite good ground in Ireland. Um, we ended up sending Alan Kerr to Ireland instead. Uh, and we we swerved it. And then it was possibility of the Arc. But the Arc was always going to be heavy ground and horrible if we if we knew we'd get good ground in, at the arc i would have been happy for him to go there i think i think on good ground he would have stayed a mile and a half and he probably would have had a good shot at being up there at the end of it anyway we have to talk about the champion states when Baid came fourth uh, why do you think he lost on that day did he feel any different when you were walking him around no, I we can't say there was anything wrong with him. He, I think, he was he turned up and he just couldn't quicken through what turned out to be probably a bit worse than soft ground. It was it had been raining all night the night before and it had been cut up. We were what the last well second last race of the day, so the ground wasn't. Great. I mean, it's been cut up by the races before. You'd had the sprinters going up the straight track as well. And I think the ground just did him out of it. And when you look at what finished in front of him, there are three stayers. I mean, there are three mile and a half horses. My Prospero that we've got, he'll be better over a mile and a half. Baybridge, brilliant horse over a mile and a half. And you've got a derby winner. We knew that we wanted better ground, but there was nothing we could do about it. And he had to finish his career somewhere and that was the obvious place. Must have been disappointing for the yard though on the day. Uh, yeah, a, a huge disappointment, but it's horse racing, isn't it? You know, can't win them all. 
We no matter how much you try, we uh, we went into it with very high hopes, and it was quite a quiet trip home. <laughs> but yeah, you have to. We had to roll the dice and see if we could do it. And he just he just didn't have the turn of foot on that ground. Um, I wouldn't have minded seeing him go to America, if I'm honest, for the Breeders' Cup mile. I think once the once the unbeaten record had gone. I don't think there would have been a whole lot to lose in going, but at the same time, there wasn't a massive amount to gain if you did win over there. And we mentioned it earlier. What's all this media coverage been like for you when you've got Matt Chapman putting the, the microphone underneath your nose? Yeah, I mean, it's it's part of part of it, isn't it? It's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind year. It's There's been, been a lot to do. I've definitely been busier uh, this year than I've, I think I've ever been in my life. Um, but it's something that comes with having a good horse and not everyone gets to experience that. And I mean, I wish they could, if they could, we wouldn't have any staffing problems in racing. We'd, we'd be very well off for staff. And because if you could give this to everybody, anyway, everyone in the world would want to do it. And every horse can't be like by winning 10 out of 11, six group ones rated one, three, five. I read the highest turf rated horse for a decade. Yeah, um, yeah, highest rated, high, highest turf rated horse in the world. Um, they they managed to put that in because Flightline only runs on the dirt, luckily. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean he's he's one of a kind, isn't he? He's, I don't think we're going to find another one in a hurry. We'd we'd love to. I mean, we'd love to have sort of ten of them in the yard, and everyone would be laughing. And will will you go and visit him at Stud? Uh, yeah, I've I've been told that any time I want to go down there, just let them know and they're happy to accommodate me. Um, but I'll definitely go and visit him. It's only up the road. It's over at Thetford, so it's not far. Um, I, I mean, it'd be nice to see him just turned out in a paddock. He hasn't been out of our yard other than race, other than racing for two years. So he's uh, he's had a long stint in, and he deserves the break really. You must have got used to him being the first horse you looked at every day. Yeah, he, I mean, he's he's been my best friend for the last two years. So I've I've been in there first thing, first horse I've seen every day, and the last horse I see in the evening before I go home. And it's strange walking in and seeing there's someone else in his box already. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it is odd not seeing him. But I mean, hopefully he has a a great career at Stud. Well, thank you very much for sharing your time working with, uh, as you say, the, the best turf horse in the world. Uh, I must also thank Kelvin Fable, a friend of mine who knows you, who uh, introduced me to you to get you to come on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network.